I'm Jane Spencer, Neiman class of 2013, and I have been looking forward to this weekend with all of you for so long. Last night, Anne-Marie called this group the greatest newsroom in the world, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about who's in our newsroom today. We have more than 400 members of Neiman Nation at the reunion this weekend, including 262 Neiman Fellows, representing more than 38 countries. Turkey, Nigeria, Bolivia, Nepal, Chile, Kenya, <laughs> hi Paula, Ukraine, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, just to name a few. <laughs> hi. Um, we have the first ever Neiman Fellow from Myanmar, a member of this year's class. I think the class of 2017 deserves a special shout out today for setting the attendance record at the reunion. They managed to get 26 Neimans and affiliates here. And I want to acknowledge the current class of 2019. I just asked members of that class to look around the room this morning. Uh, you're staring into the faces of dozens of people who are deeply, bitterly jealous and resentful of you. <laughs> We have five fellows with us this weekend who completed their Neiman Fellowships more than 50 years ago, <laughs> including former Neiman curator Bob Giles of the class of 1966. <laughs> Welcome. But as we celebrate Neiman's 80th anniversary, I want to congratulate every fellow here today on the truly remarkable achievement of outliving your profession. I actually don't believe that at all, but that's the direction my head was going when I started my fellowship six years ago. Since so many of us come to Neiman at a point of transition or conflict in our careers, I want you to take a moment to remember where you were in life and what you were thinking when you first walked up that brick pathway into Lippmann House to begin your fellowship. When I started my fellowship, I was 36 and already feeling pretty burnt out on journalism. I'd spent the previous four years launching and running the Daily Beast with Tina Brown in a very intense 24-7 startup environment. The, journal and the journalism business model was imploding. I was under intense pressure to grow the traffic every month, and I felt pretty disconnected from the values and passions that had drawn me to the profession. So when I got to Harvard, I wanted to try something totally different. And I fought my way into an undergraduate seminar in screenwriting taught by Danny Rubin, the guy who wrote Groundhog Day. Every week, we had to write a short screenplay. And when I signed up, I thought, hey, I'm a professional writer. I'm creative. This will be so much fun. I actually found it excruciating. When you're a kid, you can just sit down and make up a story. But I found that after years of writing nonfiction, that fearless, creative part of my mind had ossified. I had no story ideas. I actually brought with me today the first screenplay I wrote for that class. It's called The Tabloid, and it's about a journalist <laughs> named Fern. Um, Fern is a slightly chubby 36-year-old woman who works at a startup with a very demanding boss. <laughs> Fern is facing tremendous pressure to hit traffic targets by cheapening the news site. I really don't know how I came up, up with this. The creativity here is pretty overwhelming. Uh, this is a really terrible screenplay. But don't take my word for it. Take my professors. The margins of this are riddled with comments like, the dialogue sounds inauthentic. Too many romantic comedy cliches. <laughs> Your characters sound like people on TV, not real people. <laughs> and then at the end of this comments, he wrote lightly, don't worry, you're right on schedule. Trust the process. And I remember getting those comments back and feeling devastated and excruciatingly embarrassed. I was so deeply uncomfortable being a beginner. The only thought I had that made me feel slightly better was, OK, this guy wrote Groundhog Day. At least you must think I have the capacity to improve. <laughs> One of the things they tell you during your Neiman Fellowship 
is that you won't fully understand what you learn from it until years later. And what became to, clear to me earlier this week when I reread this truly awful screenplay is that my Neiman year taught me how to be a beginner again. And you may be familiar with the Japanese monk Shinryu Suzuki who wrote about the concept of the beginner's mind and the notion that you should approach the world with a childlike sense of openness and possibility. Thinking like a beginner requires you to detach your ego's desire to be an expert, and it forces you to abandon all your preconceptions of how things work and approach the world with a deep and abiding curiosity. And I think cultivating a beginner's mind is essential for good journalism. A beginner can tell better, more honest stories because their mind isn't crowded with ingrained narratives and preconceptions that oversimplify the world's conflicts and complexities. A beginner can take truly arresting photo photographs because they observe things others miss. A beginner can help media companies innovate by embracing exploration and experimentation. Most importantly, a beginner can see possibility and hope, even when the world feels like it's darkening. So the first event this morning is called the 90-Minute Neiman, and it's meant to be a lightning version of the Neiman seminars with Harvard professors you may remember from your fellowship. So as we head into this mini Neiman and the rest of the weekend and back to work on Monday, I encourage you to find a way to use the gift that Neiman gave all of us by making us beginners again. <laughs>